Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Dr. Andrew Kim, MD. I'm a board certified psychiatrist and today's video is called Delirium Tremens Explained. So Delirium Tremens, or the DTs for short, is a potentially lethal complication. Again, keywords, potentially deadly complication from alcohol withdrawal. And no, I'm not trying to be melodramatic or instill fear, it's just the truth. And this is why it's so crucial for our society and for clinicians to better educate ourselves about alcohol withdrawal, not just mild withdrawal, but moderate to severe withdrawal syndromes to prevent horrible, deadly outcomes. If you don't believe me, go do your own research. The DTs or delirium tremens was recognized as a potentially complex complication related to excessive alcohol use as early as 1813 okay now back then um, not much was understood about it except for the fact that it was related to alcohol so back then when kind of under recognized under treated uh, the mortality rates or death rates related to DTs was as high as 37 percent okay depending on where you read 20 to 37 percent horrible okay now in the modern day and age today with all the hospitals, with all the detox units, with all the knowledge we have, better access to care. Uh, mortality rates from DTs is still around 1% to 4%. So even with modern medicine, the death toll, the death rate is 1% to 4% of under-recognized, untreated DTs. Crazy, okay? So this is truly a potentially lethal outcome of alcohol withdrawal. And this is why it's so important for us to learn a little bit more about this, all right? So first, let's go over some of the core features, all right? The first component is delirium. So it's in the title, delirium tremens. So let's talk about delirium. In brief, delirium is kind of a fluctuating disturbance of your attention, cognition, your sensorium. Basically, you can become disoriented and confused. So there may be parts of the day where one is lucid, thinking clearly as can be, they're in the hospital going through the DTs, their family is at their bedside, they seem like their normal self. 30 minutes later, one hour later, they may totally do a 180, be confused, uh, not know what year it is, where they are, what day of the week it is, why they're even in the hospital. This may lead to agitation and frustration. They may not even remember the conversation they just had with you 30 minutes ago, lucidly. And this might fluctuate on and off, on and off throughout the day. So that fluctuating attention, orientation, sensorium, that is what we call delirium. That is the key feature of delirium tremens. Now, the other features kind of in a more severe form of DTs will also include, in addition to the delirium, hallucinations, agitation, tachycardia, which is a fast heart rate above 100 beats per minute, hypertension or high blood pressure, fever, diaphoresis, which is excessive sweating, and you can also have what's called hypovolemia. Basically, your fluid levels are low because of the fever, because of the sweating, because of your heart pumping, because you're nauseous, because you're throwing up, you're having diarrhea. There are numerous reasons as part of alcohol withdrawal that will lead to hypovolemia as well. So these are some of the core features of delirium tremens. So in general, what is the incidence or the risk of someone going through the DTs if they're going through alcohol withdrawal? Roughly 5%, again, a very rough estimate, roughly 5% of patients who go through alcohol withdrawal may experience the DTs or delirium tremens. So again, let me rephrase this and be very clear. I did not say 5% of people who drink. I said 5% of patients who are going through alcohol withdrawal. So this is a subset of patients who are going through alcohol withdrawal are likely going to also go through the DTs. Now virtually all patients who developed the DTs, they don't go straight to the DTs. You typically experience some form of milder withdrawal that occurs first that then leads to the DTs. This is why early recognition, noticing even the mild or mild to moderate warning signs of alcohol withdrawal are so crucial because if you could do early identification, intervene early and start treating and addressing even the mild or mild to moderate alcohol withdrawal, that can hopefully reduce the risk or hopefully ideally prevent one from crossing the line 
into DTs. Because once you cross that line, you may be in the midst of that delirium and the confusion and the agitation and all the medical problems I just listed as DTs. You may be in that state for days, if not even close to a week at times. Horrible thing, horrible outcome, something we want to prevent. So I know I just went on a rant about early identification and understanding even mild or mild to moderate alcohol withdrawal. So if you not, have not had a chance yet, go watch my other video, which is pretty long, but it does a more comprehensive overview of kind of the entire spectrum of alcohol withdrawal, even the milder symptoms and the milder warning signs. So go watch that if you haven't had a chance, okay? Now, what is the timing? Where is kind of the peak window when someone who experiences DTs, when will it start happening if it's going to happen? Now look, this will differ based off each person. So it's going to be somewhat different for each individual depending on how long they've been drinking, how heavy is their drinking, what is their own personal tolerance level. So this is a general guideline, okay? I know people get so caught up on timelines on some of my other videos but roughly about 48 to 96 hours after your last drink, uh, that's kind of the peak window of when the DTs may co come and start uh, for the average person, okay? About 48 to 96 hours out from your last drink. The key though is for super heavy drinkers, you can even go into the DTs even when there's still alcohol in your system. So that's kind of a fallacy or a myth that one can't go into withdrawal until your blood alcohol level is zero. No, for some heavy drinkers, you can go into pretty bad withdrawal, even just as the alcohol levels in your blood are just decreasing. You may still literally have alcohol in you and still start going into withdrawal. So this is what I mean by there's so much variability. Each person is going to be different, but in general, about 48 to 96 hours after your last drink is kind of the peak risk period for the DTs. Now, is there a specific profile or risk profile of a particular type of patient who's going through withdrawal that's more likely to go and experience DTs than the other? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we haven't identified or isolated any specific gene or chromosome or anything that can say uh, definitively this person will or won't experience the DT. So that's not something that we have available at this time. So we just have general risk factors. So again, general. Uh, older age can be a risk factor. Having more other comorbid or concurrently uh, occurring medical issues, so the more medically complex you are, higher the risk. If you've had DTs in the past, you are at a much higher risk than someone who hasn't. I know that sounds somewhat obvious, but that's true. Um, patients who develop alcohol withdrawal even while you still have alcohol in your system. So I just kind of mentioned that. So even though you have a positive BAL or blood alcohol level, you start going into withdrawal, you are likely someone who is at higher risk. It just kind of demonstrates your level of drinking is so high, you're even likely to go into withdrawal when you still have alcohol in you, kind of speaking to your high tolerance. Um, folks who have a CWA score of greater than 15 are at higher risk of DT. So what is a CIWA or C-I-W-A? It is a instrument or tool that's often used on uh, psych units, detox facilities, inpatient medical settings, where the staff, typically nurses, physicians, will come to your bedside, bedside go through a checklist of different symptoms, and it is called the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment Score, or CIWA score and the more indications or signs of withdrawal that you have, uh, the higher the score. So for those who score greater than 15 by this assessment, appear to be at higher risk as well. So these are some of the risk factors, um, general risk factors, to indicate that someone may be at higher risk of impending DTs versus the average person. So again, um, this video is focusing mainly on the DTs. I'm not gonna get into all the nuances and details of treatment for alcohol withdrawal. I have another video on that, so please go check that one out. But bottom line is this, I kept emphasizing you don't want to cross that line into the DTs. Um, as clinicians, we don't want our patients to reach that threshold and cross that line because again, once you enter that zone and cross that line, that person may be in the midst of DTs for days, if not even a week. And oftentimes, not always, but I would say most of the time, 
that requires a patient to be moved to a subacute medical floor or even sometimes the intensive care unit of a medical hospital. So this is something that requires treatment in an inpatient setting. This is not something that can be done outpatient. Yes, people are gonna comment, well, I've gone through it on my own. I'm gonna say, you are blessed. God bless you. Thank goodness that you are alive and listening to this video because again, mortality rates are even still at one to 4%, even with treatment sometimes, okay? So this is something that should be treated, ideally, in a supervised hospital setting inpatient. Oftentimes, you'll need to be in one of those intensive medical floors, and typically, you are going to need intravenous or IV, so they're going to have to hook you up um, with an IV bag to your vein and give you liquid or IV benzodiazepines, uh, Valium, which is called diazepam, or lorazepam, which is Ativan. They will give you an IV bag and kind of control the rate of it to administer that to an individual going through the DTs to try to calm down the syndrome, um, essentially almost trying to rebalance things, almost replacing the alcohol to some degree so that the withdrawal is not as harsh to calm down this syndrome to the point where the agitation is less, the patient is calmer, uh, we can have those vital sign changes resolve, etc. So again, this will typically need inpatient treatment in a medically acute or subacute floor or setting where they're typically going to give you IV benzodiazepines. Now I will say as a final comment before we wrap up, for the patient, for the person experiencing the DTs or their loved ones who are watching from the outside seeing this happen, this is an extremely traumatic experience. It's an extremely traumatic experience. Oftentimes when I talk to my patients who've gone through DTs, they'll say some of them may remember a lot of it. Others will say I only remember bits and pieces of it. Others will say I barely remember any of it at all. But for those who do remember portions of it, it can be frightening. There's memories of confusion. There's memories of hallucinations that occur. There's memories of being agitated and you're seeing medical staff pinning you down, putting you in restraints, saying, why am I tied up and I can't get out of this hospital bed? Why do I have all these needles in me and IV bags in me? I don't even know why I'm here. It is a scary, scary traumatic experience for those who go through this. And then imagine also being the loved one, the husband, the wife, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the children who come to the bedside watching this. Kind of in a helpless state, knowing I can't be the one who can fix this or make this cure instantly and have to experience this. Horrible to watch your loved one go through this. Horrible for you to be the one who experiences this. So please keep in mind as well. Um, in addition to ongoing treatment for substance use, for alcohol use as recovery, after the DTs passed, after the acute detox is passed, this is a starting point, guys. Okay, This is not the end. Once you've gone through the acute detox portion and the DTs are resolved, the acute withdrawal is resolved. This is a starting point to start recovery. A lot of work to be done in, a, in addition to the psychological, not just the physical recovery, but even the psychological recovery uh, from kind of going through this traumatic experience. It's, it takes a toll here as well as the body. So hopefully this was a helpful overview of DTs, a little bit more in depth than the few minutes I spent in my general alcohol withdrawal video. If you have questions, please leave your questions below. If you have comments, leave it below. If you've gone through this, oh God, I hope you have not. But if you have and you made it out to the other side, if you feel open enough, please share with others what you went through. Let them know I'm not exaggerating. I'm not here to do fear mongering. If you've experienced this and you've survived this, please let others here know the seriousness of this syndrome and this complex, potentially lethal uh, withdrawal complication. Let them know that I, I'm not using exaggeration here, that this is a horrible thing to have to go through and experience. But again, education is key. If we can educate ourselves, we can educate our loved ones, we can educate clinicians out there, hopefully lives will be saved. Thank you again for checking in. I appreciate your support as always. Dr. Andrew Kim, MD. Until next time, guys.